Welcome to the Bar Exam Toolbox podcast. Today we are talking to Jaretta McGinnis, a legal writing expert and one of our fabulous bar exam tutors here at the Bar Exam Toolbox. And we're chatting about the multi-state performance test or the MPT. Your Bar Exam Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan and Lee Burgess. That's me. We're here to demystify the bar exam experience so you can study effectively, stay sane, and hopefully pass and move on with your life. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website, Career Dicta. Allison also runs the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on your favorite listening app and check out our sister podcast, the Law School Toolbox Podcast. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us via the contact form on barexamtoolbox.com, and we'd love to hear from you. And with that, let's get started. Welcome back. Today, we're discussing our top bar exam performance test writing tips with special guest Doretta McGinnis. Doretta is one of our experienced bar exam and law school tutors and a former legal writing instructor. So we're very excited to have her here today to talk about the performance test portion of the bar exam, which can be a huge headache for those preparing for the bar. So to get things kicked off, Doretta, why do you think the performance test portion of the bar exam is so challenging for folks? I think the biggest problem is time management. Mm. A lot of bar examinees are overwhelmed by the MPT and the fact that they have to produce a complete legal writing document within 90 minutes from start to finish. So that, I think, is the single biggest problem. Um, And I feel that a lot of the students that I work with are repeat bar takers, and the MPT is a focus of some of their anxiety and stress about the bar exam. Yeah. I've also been speaking to a lot of attorney applicants or people who have been working in one jurisdiction and might be transferring over to another. And I find that attorney applicants oftentimes struggle with the performance test because it is not a exactly like what you would do in practice. Well, that's right. And that is something that I've noticed as well, working with non-traditional bar examinees, by which I mean people, as you've described, who are not straight out of law school. And it's often a challenge for them to put aside the style or format that they have been using in the workplace. And it's also difficult for them to put aside their substantive knowledge of the law. And I've had students, you know, like that say, oh, well, you know, I have this expertise in intellectual property and I don't really think, you know, this MPT turned out the way that I would have expected it to. You know, the law was not what I would have been looking for to apply to this problem. So I would try to work with those uh, individuals to kind of come at it as a blank slate yeah. and to remind them that all legal writing is about pleasing the audience. Well, all writing is about pleasing your audience, but legal writing in particular, you're writing for a specific audience and the audience for the MPT is the bar examiners, whereas the audience for the writing that you do at work might be a judge, might be a client, might be a supervising attorney. And those people have different expectations of what your product should be. Yeah, I think that is, that's a really good point about needing to look into their audience and focus on that. But also I find um, reminding people that this is more of like a game or an intellectual exercise and not necessarily a real world scenario. I mean, cause they, they, the graders or the, the folks who draft these exams, they can edit the case law. You know, even if you're familiar with some of this case law, it might look different, but they don't, part of the exercise is not including your own creative thinking. <laughs> so. That's exactly right. And in fact, you you need to put everything substantive aside and just accept the law for what it is, for what is presented to you in that packet. Um, And you want to bring your skills into the exam room, but not any knowledge of the substantive law. And I think that's a, a funny disconnect for people. That said, however, the law in the MPT is not insane. No. You know, it's not you know, crazy or, or uh, out of sync with, um, with, you know, the common American jurisdictions, you know, the, the federal rules of evidence uh, are pretty much the same as the Franklin rules of evidence that you're right. going to see um, on the MPT. So the law is not crazy, and I don't want to give that impression. But I do find that people who have expertise in a particular area um, sometimes do question it. Yeah, I think that is interesting. I also think one thing that people assume is that because you're not being tested on 
any sort of law that you need to have memorized, that it's got to have, that the law has to have some really intense tricks to it, right. or that they're hiding the ball somewhere in these packets. But I find that if you can step back from the anxiety, that most performance tests generally are not that tricky. They can be hard, but they're hard for so many reasons, you know, with the time crunch, with the volume of information, with the stress of the exam taking scenario, that it's hard enough. They don't need to make it super wacky. Well, I think that's exactly right. And they really are very straightforward. As as you say, they're not hiding the ball. There are no tricks. Um, the cases are, are very, you know, cleanly written, you're going to use virtually everything that they give you. There are no red herrings or, you know, they won't put you in a position of having you read a case and then having no use for it. Um, in fact, you want to try to use virtually everything they've given you. Right. One of the skills they test is separating relevant from irrelevant material, but the material that might be irrelevant is very minor. Right. You know, if they give you a bunch of code sections, there might be, you know, two sections that you really don't apply to your the problem that's presented, but they will never put you in the position of, you know, having to make the decision to jettison, you know, an entire case. Right. And they usually I think the code section example is a great example, because if they do give you some lengthy code, usually the cases help point you to the applicable code. I mean, they're not just making you kind of just read code for reading codes sake. (laughs) They give you some tips of like, this is probably the section or these are the two sections that you really have to talk about. We're just going to give you the complete, you know, quote of the, of the code. That's right. Yeah. So I think you can, if you can approach these packets with this idea that the information is there and it's your job to just, you know, parse through it, but not make it harder than it is, you can kind of take a deep breath. And I think it simplifies the assignment a little bit. Well, I think that's right. And actually, you know, as much as we've suggested that it's stressful and difficult for a lot of bar examinees, there are actually people who find it to be the easiest part of the bar exam. I sure did. (laughs) I was like, I was like, wait, I need to know no law. I just have to (laughs) follow directions. I'm a really good rule follower. I can just follow directions and write some stuff. I was like, sign me up. Exactly, exactly. And those are some of the aspects of it that, you know, I try to emphasize with students, they already have the skills, Mm -hmm. you know, because they've taken legal writing courses, they've been reading case law for three years in law school, Um, they've been applying law to facts, so they have the skills. And they, you know, can kind of relax uh, because they're not forced to memorize, you know, details or to bring any other knowledge into the room. They already have what they need uh, in order to succeed. Mm -hmm. They just need to hone that with practice in this particular format. Yeah. So let's break it down into the ways that students should be preparing for the performance test. So there are a few different performance tests floating around the country. After some recent changes in California, now there's a 90 minute performance test. Uh, It used to be three hours, and there's only one of them. There used to be two of them. Uh, There's the very popular, getting more popular every day, (laughs) the MPT, the multi-state performance test that is part of the UBE, but it's also used by other jurisdictions as well, even those who haven't fully adopted um, the UBE. And then and Pennsylvania likes to dare to be different as well and has their own 90 minute um, performance test as well. But these performance tests are all very similar in structure and kind of what is required of you to write a passing answer. Specifically in California, for those of you who might be sitting, there are only a handful of actual performance tests that have been released in this new 90 minute format. So um, we with our students, but we also recommend to other students that they use the MPT um, as the way to practice because it's going to be the closest thing to getting more practice since you don't have the years and years and years of backlog that we used to. Um, So Dorena, to get us started, could you go through what a particular performance test packet would look like for a student? Sure. Um, The MPT has a generic set of instructions. They're posted online on the National Conference of Bar Examiners website. And that's your first step. You want to read that over once. They almost never change. You're not going to waste time reading them in the exam room. And these are just the basic instructions that tell you you're in the wonderful state of Franklin, (laughs) what its neighboring jurisdictions are, all of that good uh, make-believe setting for your MPT. 
Um, and of course, you have 90 minutes and should spend about half that time planning and half that time writing, which we can break down further. So that's one piece, the instructions. The next thing, though, is the most important part of the packet, and that's the task memo or assignment memo. Mm -hmm. Every PT begins with a memo from an assigning attorney telling you what you need to accomplish and giving you very specific instructions for accomplishing that task. So in this memo, you will get the background on your client, you will find out a summary of the facts, you'll know what your client's goal or question is, and you'll be told what document you need to produce, whether that be a memo, brief, letter, or some other type of document. So that is your starting point, and that is the most important thing in this packet, because that lays the foundation for everything that follows. Next, you have the file, where you'll find the facts. And the file contains uh, documents that, for, from which you will cull the, um, the, the important facts, such as deposition transcripts, trial transcripts, correspondence, maybe a contract, emails, um, any sort of exhibits that you might find in the real world. Um, so th that's where you'll get the facts for your assignment. And then the next part is the library, and there you have your legal sources. And they can be any of the common legal sources we might find. Uh, cases, statutes, regulations, um, those are the primary things that you'll see there. Um, and and the, um, the MPTs may have those in different proportions. You may have a library that is three cases. You may have a library that has statutory sections and one or two cases. It really will vary depending on the MPT. Mm -hmm. So those are the components. Yeah, and I think students are wise to really see them as components because the packet can seem a little overwhelming because it's so lengthy. But if you break it into these sections, I think it makes it feel much more manageable. It does. And if you approach them, the, the uh, file in the library with the foundation that you've drawn from the task memo, it will all make sense. Yeah. All right. So now we kind of know what's in the packet. Um, do they set forth some pretty basic or common assignments so you can kind of have a good guess of what you might see? Yes. By far, the most common assignment is a memo. And by that, we mean the standard objective memo that you've done in legal writing class that you might do during a summer internship uh, that you might do as a junior attorney in virtually any setting. Um, the tweak here is that the format is going to be streamlined. The MPT never requires you to do a statement of facts. Mm. And I think that that makes sense. You've only got 90 minutes, and what the graders are concerned about is your analysis of the law, not your ability to write a statement of facts. So the instructions will always exclude that. So for a memo, again, you're, you're going to, to streamline that even further and have an introduction discussion, and conclusion. And that's it. No mm -hmm. brief answer, no question presented. You're going to consolidate that sort of information into the um, introduction. And then, of course, the discussion is the heart of your memo, just the way it is, you know, in law school and in the real world. So that's the most common format. Right. The, um, the next is a brief. And they're, they're often trial briefs. They may be for summary judgment or some other kind of motion uh, brief. And the, the, the brief MPTs will sometimes give you more specific instructions um, for formatting, particularly for styling the headings. And so that's a common thing to look for in your packet is to see if after that task memo, are you given specific instructions about your type of document? Yeah, because you, following directions is one of the things that they're testing. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Which awesome. sounds so silly when you say it out loud like that sometimes, right. but as a lawyer, you are required to follow directions quite often. True. And it's also a thing that makes your life easier because you don't have to panic. You don't have to say, oh my goodness, they've asked me to write this document. I don't know what it should look like. Mm -hmm. You know, the memo, they pretty much assume you've seen a memo, you, you should be able to figure that out. Um, but for some of these others, they will often give you um, directions. The most important thing with the brief, as compared with the memo, is that shift in tone and that a brief has to be persuasive. And yeah. one of my uh, observations in working with students is that a lot of students seem to be reluctant to push that persuasiveness and to make that shift. And I saw that in teaching legal writing. That was often a difficult transition. And I see it with the MPT. 
-hmm. Students are afraid sometimes to be zealous advocates for their client. And they tend to write kind of wishy-washy um, briefs where they're afraid to ask the court for the relief that they are seeking. Right. Um, and I think that hurts their grades uh, because part of the, the task here, again, is to um, to write this document that shows you are writing like a lawyer as you would in the professional world. And that would include being persuasive, of course, in a brief. Mm -hmm. And do you think students should worry about sounding too persuasive? Or do you think they you there are ways that a student can be so clearly persuasive that the grader will quickly acknowledge that they're using a different voice? I don't think I have ever seen an MPT where I thought the student had, had been too persuasive or had pushed it too far. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a line out there where you don't want to be obnoxious right. or, <laughs> you know, disrespectful. Um, but I think that line is, is much further away than, than most students think that it is. So I'm talking about things like saying, you know, the court must grant this motion because of whatever the facts are as to saying something like, you know, the court might grant this motion because, mm -hmm. you know, we should be, we will be able to prove X, right. you know, don't use right. that wishy-washy language, just say what you're, what you're looking for. And I think that's a good point too, especially given the fact that um, the graders are reading these pretty quickly. And so you, if you use wishy-washy language, it can make it hard for them to decide whether or not you're using the right tone. So just, you know, like stand up right. on your little soapbox and, you know, be in the role that they've asked you to be in the role and clearly so they can say, oh, check that box. They're using the right tone. Exactly. Exactly. Um, that's right. And that brings us to our next um, type of assignment, which is a letter. And the interesting thing about letters is they can go either way. Some of them are objective. Sometimes you're writing to a client to assess her chances of success on a particular claim. So that's going to be objective. Right. But sometimes you are writing the letter in a in a persuasive posture. You're making a demand on opposing counsel, uh, for example. So you need to follow the instructions, again, uh, very carefully, not just for format, but also for tone. And for letters, they will um, at times provide additional guidance for how to structure that uh, that letter and will indicate clearly what the um what the tone is meant to be yeah and follow the directions guys follow the directions it kills me when i see failing performance tests where people didn't follow the directions because i think that's the easiest points possible I mean, i've seen failing performance tests where people included a statement of facts when it explicitly mm -hmm. told you not to i'm like why did you spend time doing the statement of facts well that's how i'm used to doing it it's like <laughs> like, there were no points and you just like took all that time that could have gotten you points elsewhere and it's like gone. <laughs> you know, there's no way that they're going to pass you for not reading the directions. So it seems so silly, um, yeah. but it is so critical and it's so easy to not follow the directions. Well, you're right. And I've seen, you know, that uh, inclusion of statement of facts. And lately I've seen a, a disturbing trend toward um, summarizing the cases oh. rather than integrating the cases into the analysis of the, uh, of the client's problem. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes I'll see one where someone will have written just, you know, summary of the law and they'll have, you know, sort of squib summary of each of the cases. And again, I think, why did you do that? The instructions told you to integrate that information, not to set it out as a separate section. Plus, that's not what we do right. in law school or, you know, legal writing uh, professionally. Right. Um, I think sometimes it's easy to forget, you know, what skills that they're trying to test to decide if you're ready to be a lawyer. And I often have to remind my students, and I did this when I was teaching too in the classroom, that anyone can write a book report about a case. <laughs> like anyone without specialized knowledge can muddle through a case and probably summarize it for you. That is not legal analysis. That is not specialized skills that we have. What we are supposed to be trained to be so good at is being able to, you know, summarize cases, put them together to understand how the law works, and then argue how it applies to fact patterns and identify these legal issues. That's where the points come from book reports yes. don't give you any points. <laughs> like, that's right. You know. And that's exactly what the MPT is looking for, you know, and again, the instructions in the task memo will even tell you that yeah. to weave those pieces together. Um, 
So that's the letter. And then the last, of course, is is the beloved uh, wild card, as I call it. Um, and this is where the bar examiners present you with a type of document you are unlikely to have seen in law school. Um, it could be a bench memo. Um, one a few years ago was something called a lobbyist's leave behind, mm -hmm. which was a document a lobbyist would leave behind. behind. <laughs> <laughs> to argue for uh, his or her position. Um, but who has heard of that, right? I, mean, I, I definitely have not. <laughs> so. I don't know what that was. And then uh, there was the notorious, um, the notorious February 2017 finding of facts and conclusions of law mm. that, that threw people for a loop. And so when we think about these wildcard um, uh, formats, um, it, it, people have a tendency to panic but they really should not because the MPT always gives you specific directions for these. Again, they'll assume you know what a memo is, but they are not going to assume that you have ever drafted findings of fact and conclusions of law. So they'll tell you how to do it. Right. Um, so it's really not that, that difficult. But that gets to the point about practicing. You want to do a lot of practice of all of the different formats, including some of these crazy um, formats just to have that experience of reading and following the directions, um, although you may not ever see that specific document uh, again. Right. And just get comfortable with that feeling of, uh-oh, this is something I've never seen before. Because that feeling can cause anxiety to boil up and it can cause you to be flustered. And at least if you've practiced working through that on different um, kind of wild card questions that you're you're familiar with that feeling of, uh oh, I've never seen this, but you can take comfort in the fact that if you've never seen it, most everybody else sitting around you's never seen it, which means that the graders have to tell you or the examiners have to tell you how to do it. So it's getting used to like, taking that deep breath and regrouping quickly and not letting the fact that it's weird or shocking or something you haven't seen before change how you perform. Right. That's exactly right. All right. Well, if you, you know, Let's move on to how you kind of study for this performance test, because if you don't need to know any law, how do you actually <laughs> study for it? <laughs> uh, you can't listen to lectures, hours and hours and hours of lectures about it. Um, so, you know, the first thing I think that we always focus on in our team, of course, is practice, practice with a little more practice and some practice on the end of that. Um, so why do you think it is so important to just practice these performance tests? I think the more you practice, the more comfortable you become with the exam. And I think that for students who have difficulty with timing, practice helps to improve their timing. Mm. Uh, and, and I think that is the, is the critical uh, piece. Um, and, I, and, and patterns begin to develop. The more you do, the more you see the way the cases tend to fit together. The more you see that they are really not throwing in, you know, additional confusion uh, to trick you. Right. Uh, more comfortable you become with the, the format. And I think the faster you get at pulling out what's important from the cases and, and working on that really important pre-planning stage. That is, I think, where one of the biggest uh, trouble spots occurs is in planning the answer. Mm -hmm. uh, drawing law from the library, outlining it, and structuring the answer. And I think that is something that improves with practice. Yeah. So, is, is really uh, my my pitch for why a lot of practice is important. Yeah, and we'll uh, talk in a few minutes more about what we think that plan should be when you sit down with your packet. But I agree, you want the plan to be a habit. So you want the execution of how you prepare to write to be a habit because you don't want to be in the moment being like, so which should, should I read first? Should the library or the file first? You know, or how do right. I start my outline? Do I start it at this point or that point? Like no brainstorming of situations. <laughs> like you need to have exactly. a plan. That should be internalized mm -hmm. by the time you, you take the exam. That yeah. should be internalized. And then why do students often refuse to do this practice or not want to work on the um, MPT or the, any performance test? Well, I've had some people say they think that it is going to be easy mm -hmm. and they don't need to practice for the reasons that we stated earlier. They don't have to memorize anything. It's, you know, how hard could it be? Um, and I think that's a very uh, destructive attitude because at least on the UBE where it's 20% of your score, um, you know, the MPT could be a make or break component for you. 
and could certainly uh, be a source of, of relatively easy points if you do well, and that will forgive you for maybe getting a few multiple choice questions wrong on the MBE. Yep. Um, so I think some, some students have said that to me, like, oh, I thought it was just going to be so easy that I didn't really need to prepare for it. Um, others, I think, have had bad experiences in legal writing, mm. or they're secure about their writing, and they feel um, almost, you know, predisposed to do poorly on this component of the exam. Yeah, those scores so, from legal writing, tell me, <laughs> they, can, they yeah. can run deep. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So I, I think there's that. And then again, I think just the overall um, feeling that because this doesn't require memorization, and so much does, that maybe their time should be shifted more toward the memorization tasks. Yeah. Um, I think that it's, that it is some, very easy to get sucked into this idea that the only thing you should be worried about is memorizing the law. I mean, we talk about the importance of practice with um, studying essays and doing MBE questions, but I think it can just fall under this idea of like, yeah, it should be easy. I should be able to just knock these out of the park. I shouldn't have to study for them. And some people can pull that off, but I think everybody can benefit from getting some feedback. I mean, we have worked with brilliant oh, yeah. lawyers, um, and even of counsel and people who are at the top of their game, and they send the first performance test. And I've seen your feedback. It's, it is, <laughs> it is still redlined. You know? But yeah. it's redlined, because it's like, this is a very specific task, you have to shift your writing style to what's being asked of you here. And um, if you choose not to do that, you will leave points on the table. And these are easier points to get than those extra five MBE questions on the rule against perpetuities. Exactly. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And what about rewriting? Do you think it's worth rewriting performance tests if it doesn't go well when you're doing kind of your self evaluation of how you did? I, I do think so. I mean, I think it depends on how how bad it is and for what reasons it is bad. Um, I think that if it's a real, you know, train wreck in the sense that the student maybe reached the wrong conclusion, because I'll, I'll toss that out there. These MPTs really do have a right or wrong conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not ambiguous. They're not um, like a law school exam where maybe you could have reasonably come out the other way. So if someone's reached the wrong conclusion, um, I think that that is uh, a problem. They need to revisit their case reading and, and their interpretation of the facts and figure out how they came out the wrong way. Um, and I think the formatting as well um, needs to be, um, is, is worth working on and reworking if you're having a difficulty with formatting. Mm -hmm. Particularly, you know, if there are those gaps, you didn't use the case at all. That's, right. you know, problem we see, or you did the crazy things we were describing earlier, you wrote a statement of facts, or you gave summaries of the cases, that means you didn't really analyze this problem and create an analytical response that would have garnered you significant points on the exam. So in those situations, I think rewriting is worthwhile. Yeah, and I think it's important to remember, you don't always have to rewrite the whole thing. If you screwed up a section, you can just mm -hmm. rewrite that section. And so mm -hmm. I think so often students don't want to do it because they're like, well, I don't want to spend 45 minutes writing out the whole answer. Well, it's probably not 45 minutes. Maybe it's 25 minutes because you only really messed up this one area. And I think there is something to be said for understanding how the right answer should feel versus the wrong answer. I had a my torts professor who I said something to the effect of, if you're right, your answer will march and sing along with you. And if you are wrong, it will be like slogging through the mud. And, um, and I think that that is something that I've always kind of taken, especially through these kind of constructed exams where they do have a right answer. If you're fighting the MPT to make it work, it's mm -hmm. possible that you have missed the boat. Because if you've got the right answer, it does sort of fit together, kind of like puzzle pieces. It's not to mean that it's easy. It's just that there's a rhyme or reason to how it fits together. And so if you're not sure what that feels like, then you should rewrite an answer to see what that feels like. <laughs> so you can recognize it um, when you do more practice. Right. And, and speaking of sort of targeted rewriting of just specific sections or elements, you know, the headings are tend to be very important mm -hmm. in the MPT. And as I mentioned, many times the directions will even tell you here is how we write headings at our law firm. They must right. look like this. And that's an example of something that's definitely worth redoing if you didn't do it right the first time. Right. No, that's a very good point. Now, for the 
MPT specifically, the multi-state performance test, they release um, these kind of slightly crazy to go through, but it can be frustrating point sheets for, yes. the, uh, yeah. for the MPT. And then I know in California, they release um, quote unquote model answers, which are high scoring student answers, which can be equally frustrating in different ways. Um, <laughs> what do they do in Pennsylvania? Do they release student answers or do they have a key? They do kind of both. Yeah. They release um, a brief um, kind of outline of what the answer should be. Um, and they do release some sample answers from students. Um, so the, the, the sort of summary outline comes from the bar examiners and then the answers from the students come okay. from, from people who passed the exam. So with the performance test, with the multi-state performance test point sheets, um, how does a student go about using those so they don't get completely overwhelmed? Well, those are very difficult to use because they are not formatted the way the student's answer will be formatted. So for example, if the task was to write a memo or the task was to write a brief, the point sheet is a point sheet <laughs> and it doesn't look like a memo or a brief. So that is the problem. I think that what students need to do is to focus on the main um, sections in the, in the point sheet. The point sheet will often be divided into sort of topics that should have been covered in your answer, again, whether it was a memo or brief, whatever it might have been. And those are the areas to see um, whether you've used the law and the facts and coordinated them within the section the way the point sheet does. The right. point sheets are often laid out with bullet points. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm giving, giving point sheet a different meaning um, as, <laughs> as the points you earn. Um, so I think you want to look at those, those you know, bullet points of law and facts for each topic and see if you did that in your answer. And I think that the kind of frustration that can come with some of these point sheets, the other side of that is you might find it very helpful to get feedback from like a living human being on this work um, because that feedback might be more meaningful to you than the point sheet. So some schools, you know, are offering programming where you can get feedback from maybe your academic support program, or they might have some bar support services. Um, you can hire tutors like us and we can give you that feedback. Uh, we have our writing of the week program um, where you can listen to Doretta <laughs> since you um, did this for the MPT walk through through and I think it's five different MPT questions mm -hmm. and kind of facilitate you doing practice and explain what the answer would be in a much clearer way than the point sheets. We give you the point sheets, but we also give you um, what in my opinion is a much easier version of a key <laughs> to be able to grade your work. Um, so no matter what, if you're frustrated by the way that you're supposed to evaluate your own work, try and get better at that, but also make sure that you're getting some sort of feedback so you know if what you're doing is right or wrong. I think that's right. Um, and I also w would suggest, just as we've mentioned, California and Pennsylvania releasing sample answers, there are jurisdictions out there that do release passing MPT answers. Oh, good point, yeah. So, you know, if you just Google search that, you can, can pull those up. Again, I take all of that with a grain of salt um, because they're, you know, they're not perfect, but at least you are going to see a solid answer that is formatted correctly. Yeah. That is not a point sheet, but is formatted the way your document should have been formatted. So, for example, now that New York has switched to the UBE, um, I've looked at some New York uh, released answers for the recent administrations on the theory that New York's a huge state. They've got a lot of takers, you know, the, they're the, the best ones that the bar examiners have chosen in New York are, are probably going to be, you know, pretty good quality. Right. Yeah. That's a really good tip. All right. So what about this plan of how to approach the performance test? <laughs> we've, we've been <laughs> referencing this. Um, so, you know, you and I both agree, don't go in without a plan. Um, and so what is kind of your suggested basic approach um, that we've mm -hmm. found has worked for students? Okay. Well, we want to start by, again, ignoring those generic instructions, just give them a very quick skim and really dive in to the task memo. Um, and make some notes from that or mark it up because that's, again, the place where you're finding out about your client's situation, the question you've been asked, the task that is presented to you, and any specific formatting requirements. 
So I would spend a couple of minutes with the task memo, uh, absorbing it and taking some notes um, on it and letting that lay the foundation for what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. The next thing is the file. And this is a problem spot because some people get very bogged down in reading the file. You don't want to do that. You want to just skim through it, literally flip through the pages and say, oh, look, there's a bit of trial transcript. Oh, look, here's a police report or whatever it might be just to see what's there. Yeah. It's very common that the task memo even tells you what's going to be in there and gives you a little preview. So you don't want to spend a lot of time there diving into that. Mm -hmm. You then want to get onto the library. And here's where you're going to spend your first big chunk of time, maybe 20 minutes or so, um, reading the cases and outlining the law. Now, some people like to get fancy with reading the cases and look at what jurisdiction they're from and read the most recent case first. And they think there's some, you know, complexity to that. And in my experience, there is not, I would read that library straight through. Mm -hmm. If you have cases, the cases tend to be cumulative. It is very, very common for the first case, for example, to set out a rule or a, a test with elements and then for a subsequent case to further explicate some of those elements, let's say. Right. Or the first case says, oh, there are three relevant theories here, one, two, and three, and then the next case goes all in on that third theory. So reading the cases in order is always going to be the right decision. Um, if you have statutory sections, there there's a little bit of debate. You know, Do you read the cases first and see which sections of the statute the, the cases um, interpreted, or do you read through the statute first and then read the cases? They always put the statute ahead of the cases. I would tend to read through it and just see what's there with a view toward then really honing in on the sections that are relied upon in the cases. Yeah, I, but agree. I would agree. I think the skim mm -hmm. the case, you know, the statutes and then but kind of sit on your hands. Don't get too deep. Don't do a deep dive into the statutes because you don't really know yet which parts are important. Exactly. And the parts that are in the cases are going to be the most important parts. Right. So you need to, to, to read that all very actively. And as you are reading, you need to be extracting the law um, and pulling out the rules and somehow outlining the law. And this is a point, again, where there is some debate. Some people love to outline by hand and feel that that is important. Other people like to outline on the screen. I'm very much in the screen camp um, because I think that outlining the law on the screen gives you the ability to move pieces around, to cut and paste, and to organize the heart of your document, whether that's the discussion section of a brief, excuse me, discussion section of a memo, argument section of a brief, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. So I make some notes on screen with what the, the legal rules are that you're pulling out of these cases. And I would hone in anytime you see a numbered list. This is my favorite MPT tip. They love numbered lists. Oh yeah, they do. They do. So if you see anything that's numbered, you should be jumping all over that, you know, yep. and laying your, your argument or discussion out in accordance with that, the numbered list of factors and making sure you're discussing each one of them. So you're going to outline the law and then you want to plug in some of the key facts from the case cases that pertain to each of those aspects of the law. So you're kind of summarizing the, the, the law, but you're also synthesizing. Again, you may have to put the pieces together. You may have to, to put two or three cases together to fully explore um, the law, just like you did in law school. Right, and I think that's one, because I'm a bit more in the handwriting camp, but I mm -hmm. think one of the the things that can be tricky that you have to play with with taking notes on your screen is it's so easy to move into that book report 
mini yes. brief um, area because it's so validating to just type and copy things out of the cases because yep. you yep. feel like you're doing something. So it takes a lot of discipline um, and practice to make sure that if you are going to choose to organize the law on the screen, that you are being very thoughtful about what you're writing down and that you are not wasting time or making these long paragraphs of rule statements because again, there's no specialized skills um, that you're getting reported for for copying things out of a case. (laughs) (laughs) That is absolutely right. And I I agree with you completely that that is the downside of the screen method. It has to be used with discipline. Yeah. So if you can't make it work, then try the hand more handwriting because that kind of removes the ability to write these lengthy book reports because I can type incredibly fast. I cannot handwrite the same volume of information um, as I can on the screen. So it's, that's why you have to practice to constantly evaluate, like where are your own pitfalls? Where, where can you, um, do you have to protect yourself almost from yourself and then, you know, make those changes? Yes. And that gets back to our point about doing a lot of practice and starting early. Yeah. Um, Because I have worked with students who have tweaked their approach in, in the course of practicing. Maybe they started on uh, either handwriting or on screen, and then they ended up with some sort of hybrid system, Uh, but they figure out what is most efficient and what works well and effectively um, for themselves. So I don't think it's a one size, you know, fits all um, approach and taking the time to practice gives you the opportunity to figure out what is optimal for you. Right. And then once Um, you've got that planning done, then it should be very easy to execute the writing of the answer. Precisely. But now after we've outlined the law from the library, we've got to go back to the file. Right. That's our our kind of approximately 20 minute chunk. And there we are pulling out those key facts that, you know, correlate with each element of the the rule that Mm -hmm. we've set out. And again, that task memo gave you a very good preview of how these pieces are going to fit together. Right. So you do that. At this point, you've got your answer pretty much outlined, and then you should have approximately half your time or 45 minutes to really write it and put it into final form. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I know that you and I have talked about together, but we're also um, always reminding students is this is a professional exercise. And so you don't want it to look sloppy. You want it to look professional. You want to present yourself as... Um, a member of this bar that's what you're trying to get and so don't be sloppy you know use thoughtful formatting you know use thoughtful spacing try not to have like your headers riddled with typos you know just be (laughs) be professional it doesn't have to be perfect because it's under timed conditions and you'll even see that in model answers they're not perfect because they're written under timed exam conditions but you know also remember that you don't want to be disrespectful to the grader and make their job very hard because they can't follow what you're writing. Exactly. Exactly. And that is, again, where following directions and formatting is so important because you don't want your MPT to be the one that looks weird and attracts negative attention. Right. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's difficult to comprehend or it, it, it was supposed to be a memo, but you wrote a letter, you know, yeah. it's, that's negative attention. Yes. that you do not need. And it's interesting just to, to circle back to the, the point about um, how it's going to be a good answer, but no answer is perfect. You know, the, the point sheets uh, used to say, you know, we're a comprehensive point sheet and you don't need to have do all of this in order to do a uh, passing answer. You could write an excellent answer without all of these points. You don't need to hit on absolutely everything. And they removed that language a while ago, but I think the spirit of that is still true. Mm-hmm. And look at the answers released by jurisdictions. Um, you will see that they are very, very good answers, but they are not perfect. And they do not include absolutely every detail that is found in the point sheet. Yeah, that's very a very good point. One thing that I've noticed the longer we all do this work together is that um, we're seeing more and more like three L's who had concerns about legal writing. You referenced that this is a lot like what you learned how to do in your legal writing classes, um, that they are wanting to practice these 
performance tests early, either the summer before bar prep or in the year before bar prep. And I think the one thing about the performance test and bar writing in general is it can be this part, because you don't need to know any law, is something great that you can work on and get familiar with outside of the bar prep period. Some law schools will have classes like bar prep. You and I have both taught these bar prep classes or preparing to take bar prep classes. (laughs) I I don't even know the best way to describe them, but they can give you some initial um, support and help in learning how to do these different parts of the test. But I think the performance test is one of those things where you can study it, figure out your plan, practice executing it, and then kind of put it on ice and then revisit it closer to the exam and it will come back to you. Yes, I think that's right. And as you know, that is one reason why we typically start our bar work with a student. Um, with the MPT, especially those you know folks who start preparing uh, well in advance of the exam, right? Uh, that's the thing. We knock it out, they solidify their skills, and then they return to it for a little bit of tune-up and refresher uh, closer to the exam. Yeah. So you know, it's really something that you can be open to. I mean, you can find um, performance test practice you know online from just googling. If you want to find a few, you could go to your academic support at school if you're still in school and ask if they have any you know bar materials that they can share. You know, we have people who are tutoring students who work with us who want to work through some of these. Um, but if this is something that has worried you, if legal writing is anxiety inducing, and you are concerned, it's better to be concerned before the like, <laughs> eight weeks before the bar exam. <laughs> yes. 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 If you've, if you've struggled with legal writing, you already know who you are. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, That's don't true. be shy and come forward and, yeah. and work on this. Yes, yeah. sure. For sure. And you know, it really has the capacity to improve your legal writing uh, beyond the bar exam. True. Uh, yeah. You know, it really does because they, the, the bar examiners are looking for the professional standard yeah. of organization and analysis. And it is um, really a slice of what you'll be doing um, in practice. And in fact, I mean, I've used the MPT as a vehicle to help people who are struggling with legal writing because it's, you know, it's a confined, discrete assignment and you can really focus on the skills without, you know, getting distracted by, you know, having to research a, a broad area yourself or making those dis- decisions about which cases to include or exclude, you're going to use everything that they give you. Right. And we can focus on on the skills and putting the pieces together. Yeah. Right. Before we run out of time, I do want to focus on time management for a minute, because that's something we raised as one of the challenges of, um, of the performance test. So, you know, what do you think are some of the top things that students should try or focus on to help with time management issues? I think following the attack plan structure that we just described is very helpful to students, including kind of internally timing uh, those components. Mm -hmm. So that students work with setting a timer. So if we said, for example, that our reading and outlining of the library should take about 20 minutes, you know, set a timer for, for, for 20 minutes. Um, don't just set a timer for 90 minutes for the whole task. Set those internal, you know, timers for those those breakpoints and see how much you got done within that period. Right. So I think that is helpful um, for students. I also think that we have to hold on to the idea that this is not going to be the best piece of legal writing anyone has ever produced. Right. And that it has to be good enough to pass and we want to maximize points. But I think some people get bogged down in their own perfectionism and spend way too much time on it. I mean, these MPTs could expand to fill, you know, many more hours sure. than 90 minutes. So I think it has to be, you know, confined. When I work with students, I if they're really struggling with time management, I do have them start untimed because I want to see if if I left them to their own devices, how long would it take them to complete this task? Right. You know, and so maybe instead of 90 minutes, it takes them, you know, two hours. And then we have to figure out where is that time being spent? Where is that extra half an hour being spent? And how can we cut it back? You right. know, is, is it spinning wheels and not knowing what to do? Is it getting bogged down in the file? Is it not taking effective 
notes and outlining so that that prep time is kind of wasted or inefficiently spent. Where is that that time being spent that we can either speed up or eliminate what is being done in that time? Right. No, that, that's really good advice. And I think, you know, there's discipline that comes with doing this practice in 90 minutes. And they no one will know what you can do past 90 minutes. At a certain point, you have to be able to perform your best in the 90 minutes allowed. Um, and even for folks who get extended time for accommodations, you might feel like, well, I get time and a half, I have so much extra time. Even then, it is still about discipline, because it's often not a, it doesn't feel like a lot of extra time. It's usually still just enough time for you to do the task. And so you you have to remain disciplined and not indulge yourself in having too much extra time because they're not going to read it. I mean, <laughs> it, they stop reading at nine, you know, 90 minutes. You have to like stop, <laughs> like, yep. put down, like remove your hands from the computer. <laughs> like it's, you know, right. they don't know what else you could have written. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. Well, um, any final thoughts, Jaretta, that you wanted to pass on to our listeners about the performance test? Um, I, I would think back to legal writing class. I mean, that's what it all comes back to to me. You already have the skills. Whether you believe it or not, you have learned everything that you need to know to succeed on the MPT by the time you have finished law school. And you should view the MPT as an opportunity to demonstrate those skills in a confined time period with a very small universe of materials and work to hone the skills you already have to a point of efficiency where you can accomplish that within 90 minutes. And if you can do that, you'll score well on the MPT. Yeah, spoken like a true former legal writing professor. (laughs) (laughs) Is there any more important topic in law school? Exactly, exactly. Not. It is the foundation of everything. Well, with that, we are out of time. I want to take a second to remind you to check out our blog at barexamtoolbox.com, which is full of helpful tips to help you prepare and stay sane as you study for the bar exam. We have a lot of helpful posts on the performance test as well. You can also find information on our website about our courses, tools, and one-on-one tutoring programs to support you as you study for the UBE Um, or California Bar Exam. If you enjoyed this episode of the Bar Exam Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review and rating on your favorite listening app. We'd really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you're still in law school, you might also like to check out our popular Law School Toolbox podcast as well. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Allison at lee at barexamtoolbox.com or allison at barexamtoolbox.com, or you can always contact us via our website contact form at barexamtoolbox.com. Thanks so much for listening, and we will talk soon.